Welcome to the summer sermon series that our Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada is providing for congregations. I am Reverend Prima Samuel, and I serve as the assistant to the Bishop for Congregational Life of the Synod of Alberta and the Territories. It is a blessing to be with you today. In the spirit of respect, reciprocity, and truth, I honor and acknowledge that I live and work and pray on traditional and ancestral territory of many First Nations, Métis and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. I am speaking to you from Treaty 6 territory and the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 4 in Leduc. Leduc is situated on the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 6, which includes 16 Alberta First Nations as well as the peoples of the Métis Nation of Alberta. I acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit, who have lived in and cared for these lands for generations. I am grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us today and those who have gone before us. I make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory I reside or am visiting. I invite you to take a moment in gratitude to acknowledge the land in which you are joining us from. Our gospel this Sunday is from the Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 12th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already ablaze. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what constraint I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say it's going to rain. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say there will be scorching heat and it happens. You hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Gee, somebody got up on the wrong side of the bed. Somebody give this Jesus some coffee. And who is this guy, this Jesus? I can't seem to recognize him. So far, Jesus has been teaching as he goes, a parable here, an exhortation there. In fact, earlier in chapter 12 of Luke, Jesus' teachings feel rather assuring and cozy. He tells his followers not to worry to consider the birds of the air and the lilies of the field, reminding that they are precious in God's sight. And hear these words of comfort. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You know, now this is my kind of Jesus. But our text for today gives us a real pause. Here is the Prince of Peace, the one the angels sang their praises about at his birth, the love of God incarnate, Jesus, the Christ, telling his listeners that he has come to bring division? By following him, families will sunder, communities will sunder. But this isn't peace. This isn't comforting. This is chaos. And we don't know what to do with this passage. 
It feels like Jesus has had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. I have come to bring fire to the earth, and oh, oh, how I wish it were already ablaze. Do you think I have come to bring peace to earth? No, I have come for division. Jesus is confronting and disrupting, turning things upside down. Well then, what happened to considering the lilies of the field and the birds of the sky and our preciousness in God's sight? I mean, Jesus, where did this angry guy come from? A commentator that I read in preparation for this even called this passage embarrassing. It wasn't the Jesus as we understand him. This is an angry, demanding Jesus who makes us uncomfortable and uneasy. In the children's novel, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe from the Narnia series by C.S. Lewis, four British siblings enter a coat closet and discover a whole other world called Narnia. This magical world is filled with talking animals and the original Lion King, a lion named Aslan, who rules over all of Narnia. The youngest child, Lucy, strikes up a conversation with Mr. Beaver, asking about Aslan. Is he quite safe? she asks. To which Mr. Beaver replies, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he is good. Of course he isn't safe. But he is good. Of course God isn't safe. But God is good. Perhaps this text is so uncomfortable for us because it doesn't match our experience. That isn't what being part of a church is all about. But what we don't understand in this part of the world is something that my relatives in India understood all too well, or rather understand all too well. My maternal grandmother, who I call Amama, was known as a prominent evangelist and a faith healer. Her ashram stands to this day outside of Bangalore in India, where I spent much of my younger years as a child. When my Amama died, her children by blood and in ministry continue that service at the ashram to honor her life and the ministries. Education for rural children, a church where the word is proclaimed, an orphanage among many ministries continue to this day. While there I saw many things that I can only call a miracle in the most real sense of the word. And yet it wasn't always that way. My Amama was in fact a convert from Hinduism. She comes from a Brahmin family who were temple builders, a family that was deeply honored, a family that deeply honored their faith that they were born into, a family that was very well respected and mind you, quite wealthy too. She, as the only daughter, was loved, adored, and spurned. She was cherished. But when my grandma, my amama, encountered the gospel and converted, everything changed. Her husband, my grandfather, my tata, initially wasn't even in favor of her decision. 
He went as far as to say, do it in hiding, in silence. But do the pujas and the rituals to the deities of Hinduism just to show the family. Because he knew what the repercussions were likely to be. But eventually, her persuasion, her faith, and her passion won him over, and he joined her in this new faith. Now that brought change. Their families tried to convince them, even threatened them. But when that didn't work, they just shunned them, ostracized them. But many of her family members never reconciled themselves to the fact that she is now a Christian. She followed Jesus as her Lord, her Christ, her Savior. Her family shunned her for the rest of their days and hers. Her brother who adored her didn't want anything to do with her or anyone associated with her. She was dead to him as long as she remained a follower of Christ. Despite everything that she had to endure, her faith continued. She did not waver in following the one whom she had encountered, the risen Christ, and her devotion to him was absolute, even at the cost of her family. She was a Christian. It was who she was until the day she died. Just as my Amama performed great acts of love and compassion, her family, influenced deeply by their mother, went on to a life of service. Her daughter's ministry was quite different than my Amama's. She was a consummate church diplomat, but her life had an incredible impact on so many others as she strove for justice for women, the Dalits, and all who were vulnerable to the whims of those in power. And it all started when my Amama chose to follow Jesus. Things are so different in this part of the world. Many of us were born into our church and have known nothing else. The Canadian society is one where various religious practices have a place, and most people are open to that wonderful tapestry of faith traditions. Any persecution that does arise is decried by most people. I wonder, I wonder how we would react if we were put into a position like my Amama when we stand to lose everything just for following Jesus. We may, we may believe that this is a hypothetical consideration, which we will likely never encounter, yet we face an important crux in our history. The role of faith groups is being tested right now in North America. Often our name as Christians has been attached to a lot of questionable behavior, just to put it mildly. Will we stand with justice and stand up against these practices and for the rights of all people? Will we act as stewards and protectors of the created world? Will we follow the example of Jesus, the justice bringer, and risk alienating our friends, our family, are members of our church? Or will we side with the status quo, which would have the church stay silent, concentrating on an easy, complacent spirituality, a few fun programs, and generally staying out from underfoot? That is the easier way. But is that the way Jesus calls us to? Do we have the courage, even though we know that if we follow where Jesus leads, we may find out firsthand what he is talking about in this passage? The truth is, my friends, 
whether I am telling the story of my amama or asking us to consider the way of mercy, the result, if we are left on our own, is the same. We would fail. That's a guarantee. If the Holy Spirit has not been with my amama, she would not have lasted. If the Holy Spirit had not been with the many converts throughout history, they would have failed too. And any justice work we try to do would be dead even before we had a chance to start it if the Holy Spirit isn't with us. Hence, this passage becomes less about Jesus being angry to Jesus being prophetic. He knew beyond a shadow of doubt what would happen for a person to take his, her, or their call seriously. It would burn. It would mean sacrifice. It would mean division. It would mean pain. But the world needed those people in the world. The world needs the message that we are to carry to all whom we encounter. The call goes on for all of us, and the consequences do not change. That isn't easy to hear, but it is still the truth. Just as it was when Jesus first uttered these words, we are called to speak truth to power, stand up for the weak and vulnerable, advocate for the created world, and live into the radical love of God. We will have hope when the world falls farther and farther into despair. It will cost us, and yet it will also sustain us. It will sustain us with the knowledge of God's Spirit with us always, now and forever. God is breathing God's very life into us so that we may take the step and the one after that, and the one after, and in so doing, discover the life of purpose, grounded in that same radical, all-encompassing love. It was that love that sustained my mama. It is that love that sustained every Christian throughout the course of time. It is the same love that will sustain us. As the fire burns, the Spirit reminds us that God is with us, like and in the fire. Like the ashes left after the forest fire produce rich soil, the ashes left behind after the strange fire of God starts to pour new life. God has used dust and ash to create since the Garden of Eden. Kneeling in the soil, breathing new life, God does so with us today. God kneels in the dirt and the ash, gently whispering and tending, patiently cherishing and coaxing new life out of places that appear charred and ruined where we see only worthless destruction, God sees hope, promise. Despite everything that may be lost as we follow our risen Christ, nothing, I say nothing could be greater than that amazing gift of love. And for that love, for that challenge, for that call, we say amen and thanks be to God.